programming in my style sheets. Um, I have a background in computer science, so I actually, uh, computer science concepts really excite me, and I also love CSS. So SAS is kind of the perfect marriage between the two. And today I'm gonna talk a lot about how we can use SAS and Compass to program some crazy CSS. So what do I actually mean when I say programming CSS? Um, we know that CSS is just a style sheet language. We use it to tell the browser what we want our markup to look like. But aside from a few things that have only very recently been added to CSS, it doesn't really do anything for us. It can't calculate things or have conditionals or variables or stuff like that. Whereas a programming language, um, we can actually tell it to do things for us. It accepts input, it can manipulate data, it can return output. Um, the technical term for this is that it is Turing complete. Uh, and I could talk for the entire rest of the hour about Turing machines and Turing completeness, but for the purpose of the purposes of this talk, we'll just say that something that is Turing complete accepts input, can return output, and anything that you can write, anything that can be represented in a Turing complete language can be represented in any other Turing complete language. And SAS is Turing complete, so we're gonna do some cool programming stuff with that today. So just a really quick uh, warm up refresher course. Uh, we know that SAS has variables. Probably everybody uses them. Uh, you can interpolate them as strings, you can do um, math operations on them, division, addition, stuff like that. We know that SAS has mixins. Uh, mixins are awesome for reusing chunks of CSS. Uh, mixin can take arguments, it can not take arguments, it's totally up to you. Uh, SAS has functions. There are a number of really awesome built-in functions and you can also write your own functions in your SAS files just like this. Um, the main difference between a function and a mixin, even though they look pretty similar, is that a function will return a value rather than outputting CSS the way a mixin does. Uh, so the other fun thing about functions, and mixins have this as well, is you can have optional and named arguments. So this is an example of some function. You can choose to pass one argument, two arguments, or you could skip the middle argument entirely if you wanted to. So SAS has data types. Um, you're probably most familiar with numbers, strings, colors. Those are the most common things that you have in CSS. Uh, it also has booleans, which are true and false, nulls, which are kind of just empty values, and lists. So lists are everywhere. If you've ever written a font stack, you've written a list in SAS. Uh, if you have ever written a string, you've also written a list in SAS since everything in SAS, even just a string, is a list of length one. And this is just an example just to prove that what I'm saying is actually true. So I have these different variables with different values and I just wrote a quick thing to loop over my list of variables and use the type of function to put the actual type of each thing into a list and you can see from the output, I'm not lying, there are actually all these different data types. SAS has logical operators and relational operators. This is really where we start to get into the computer science programming stuff. Uh, you've got and, or, and not, and of course a whole bunch of different relational operators. SAS lets you use control directives. Um, you can do if, else, and there are all these great looping constructs, each, for, and while, and these are the kind of things that you'll get in any respectable programming language. So how are we going to use all of these awesome things to actually make something? So. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I have noticed that a really big trend in the design community is to design these beautiful weather apps. Um, <laughs> you see them all over the place. Most of the time they're not real. Someone just decided that they wanted to make a weather app. But I mean, that's pretty cool because the weather affects everybody. The data is very easily accessible and it's very easy to make it look really nice. And there's a lot of interesting ways that you can show this information. So, I had the crazy idea. I really like to take things that were never meant to be done in CSS and use SAS to do them in CSS. So I was like, I know just the thing. I'm gonna take a weather app and I'm gonna make it using just SAS. 
So um, the way I did it for this example, I actually have a Ruby on Rails app that is hitting a weather API and passing some of the information from the weather API into SAS files, which are then dynamically compiled and output on the front end. And that's how we're going to see the results of our weather. Um, I make no claims to the practicality of doing such a thing in production, but it does make for a lot of fun, just example stuff. So I start off with this. Um, there's really nothing special here. I'm looping over the 48 hour forecast that's returned from the weather API. So each hour in the next 48 hours gets a row. I print out the temperature value and the time. At this point, there's nothing special. There's only structural CSS. There's nothing styling it. So I thought that it would be cool. I really like the apps that use color to kind of display the information. So this is the look that I wanted to achieve. Um, SAS has a lot of built-in, SAS and Compass have a lot of built-in color functions and stuff that are gonna make this a lot of fun for us. So the first thing we had to figure out was how are we going to map a temperature to a color? Um, if I wanted to make this extremely easy, I would just use the full light color spectrum, map it to something on the hue wheel, and then this talk would be over, but that would be too simple. So, and anyway, the full light color spectrum doesn't totally make sense when you're talking about temperature, like I don't know what temperature green or purple would represent, but the temperature color spectrum is actually a real thing. We use this when we're talking about the lighting in photography or the lighting in a room or something. You say that the colors are more warm or more cool. So we're gonna go with this. And we need to figure out a way to map a temperature to a point on this color spectrum. So I just went ahead and kind of picked arbitrary points along the spectrum um, and I saved the hex code off for each one of those. And then I chose a range of temperatures that each one would um, match against. Now, I actually grew up in Florida, so I think that anything below 60 degrees is freezing, but I tried to be a little more judicial with it, and I just went ahead and gave all of the ranges a 14 degree spread. So now I have this set up. It's just our color values. I set up variables to store the lower limits of our temperature ranges. So uh, burning is 100. Anything above 100 we'll consider to be burning. If it's above 86 but below 100, then it's hot. Um, and this long list of temperatures, which goes very far off to the side of the screen, this is the same exact list that I have used in the markup to loop over and build the markup. So for every temperature in this list, there is a div in the markup. So now I'm gonna loop over my list of temperatures and I'm gonna figure out where each temperature falls within the different ranges that we've chosen. Um, I'm gonna to default to saying that the color is freezing, and then as I check through this crazy if-else ladder, if it finds that our temperature falls into a higher range, then it'll store that value in color, and then we'll just set the row and child, we're keeping track of row up above, we'll set the background color to that, increment our row, and continue iterating over our list of temperatures. And what we end up with is something that looks like this. So the markup is pretty straightforward. It's just a bunch of row nth childs. There's one for every um, hour in the next 48 hours. Um, well, New York's weather is too lovely to be very interesting. So let's see what Texas looks like. Um, so this is the weather for Corpus Christi. Um, it looks highly unpleasant. It's extremely hot. And then I picked a few other ones. Portland looks like it has it's pretty nice. And then Alaska also looks fairly terrible. <laughs> so um, that if-else ladder that we wrote was kind of crazy. Um, so how can we improve upon that? So before I had the color and their temperature limits just as separate variables, but I've moved them into a list of lists. So this color limits um, variable that we have at the top is a comma separated list of space separated lists. So we see cold, cold temp, that's a space separated list. It's a color limit pair. But aside from that, we're gonna keep looping over the temperatures list the same way we did before. But now instead of that crazy if else ladder, we'll, we're going to loop over our new list of lists and just check if our temperature is greater than the limit in that list. 
And other than that, the rest is exactly the same. We'll set the background color for the row that we're at, increment row by one, and keep going. And you can see the end result is the same as it was before. So the compiled CSS looks the same, the output, the resulting styles look the same, but uh, it's kind of blocky. It's not really too interesting. So we're gonna figure that out. But first, just a few different ways that we could write this code if we wanted to. So before we were using an each to iterate over our list of temperatures, but um, there's a ton of, a bunch of other looping constructs in SAS. So what if we change it to a for loop? Um, in this case, I actually think that this is a really good optimization. We no longer need to manually keep track of our row variable and increment it on each iteration because the for loop will increment it for us each time it iterates through. Um, the for loop also, so in this case, we're doing from row, row one through the length. You could also do from one to the length, and the difference is whether or not it includes the last index. We could also use a while loop here. In this case, it's not much of an optimization because we still have to manually keep track of the row value ourselves. but um, it's possible. It's still a thing that you could do. Uh, the difference here is that the row loop is not actually going to change the value, or sorry, the while loop is not going to change the value of row the same way the for loop will, uh, while is just going to run for as long as its condition is true. And then the last little optimization we could make, so I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the for loop here. Um, before, before we had a little if check here, but in programming there's this thing called a ternary operator and it's basically a way of writing an if else statement on one line and it's super convenient. And SAS has an if function that more or less mimics the behavior of a ternary function. So whereas before we had an if statement here, we can now use the if function, we'll say if the temperature is greater than the comparison temperature, set it to our compare color, otherwise set it back to color. So in the case that temperature isn't greater than or equal to compare temp, color actually doesn't change at all. So again, this is what we end up with. We have changed our code in a few ways, but it still looks exactly the same. And like I said before, it's not super interesting. We're starting to get colors, but it's kind of blocky. I think we can do a little bit better. So the hard part now, we need to figure out how we're going to get these colors that are between ranges, right? Before we would just use one color for every temperature in the hot range, but that made it not look very interesting. But SAS has a ton of color functions that we can use to do something interesting here. Compass also has a few really good ones. And I think the perfect one that we want for our case is gonna be mix, which is gonna let us pass two colors, mix them together, and mix them together weighted depending on which color we want more of. So let's see an example of how this would look. Well, let's say that our temperature is 93, which is exactly between 186. So we have our two colors, we have burning, which is red, and hot, which is orange. Our temperature is 93. We need to figure out where 93 falls within the lower and upper limits, and then we can call the mix function with our two colors and the percentage. Um, so you would expect the result to be fairly orange since it's right in between. We can see that it is. Um, in this case, since the percentage is 50, and that is the default value for the mix function, we can optionally choose to pass it or not. Um, again, if our temperature was 88, which is much closer to hot than it is to burning, we would expect the color to be much more orange, and we can see that it is. And same thing if our temperature was 98. It's very close to burning. We would expect it to be very nearly red, and it is. So, okay, like I said, we have two challenges here. Whereas before we were just finding one color, now we need to find two colors, and we need to know where our temperature actually falls within that range. So the second one is, um, yeah, so we're gonna use custom functions to do this. The second problem is actually easier to solve, so we'll start there. Um, we had the math for this on the previous slide. We'll write this ratio function that'll take a value, which will be our temperature, the upper and lower limits of our range, and then it'll calculate where our temperature falls in that range. And this math actually comes out to be a number between zero and one, 
So we'll use the percentage function to turn it into a percent value that we can then pass back to the mix function. Now the next crazy thing that we're going to do. So we have this each loop that was looping over our list of lists. But what if we could write a function that would calculate all of this stuff for us without using the each construct? So now I'm going to introduce a programming concept called recursion. So in computer science, recursion is a method where the solution to a problem depends on the solution to smaller instances of that exact same problem. Um, so you can think of this in real life if you hold up two mirrors facing each other and you see the reflections of the mirror infinitely. That is infinite recursion reflection happening in that mirror. And um, this is actually, I think every programming language has this. It's actually used in a lot of programming languages in place of looping constructs at all. Um, I think it's mostly older programming languages, but if you wanted to write a, a for loop or something, you would actually just have to write a function that was recursive. And the way most programming languages implement that is that a function is able to call itself. And that's what we're going to do. So just a really quick example, um, a really common computer science uh, exercise is to write a recursive function to calculate the factorial of n. I know this is pretty intense for the, the very end of the day on Saturday. So we're going to, so the factorial of n, it's going to be the product of every number n and below. So in this case, if n is 10, it'll be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7, on and on and on. So we could write that, it, we could calculate that in a simple while loop. Um, this would actually be a little bit cleaner if I had written in, in something like JavaScript, because JavaScript lets you increment and decrement variables, but that's beside the point. This still works correctly. It's pretty simple. For as long as i is greater than 0, we'll do n equals n times i, decrement i by 1, and continue looping until we don't want to go anymore. So this is what the recursive function solution to this would look like. Um, you can see the function returns n times a call to itself, and it passes n minus 1. So every time the function calls itself, it reduces n by 1 each time. And then it's going to keep calling itself until it hits this condition if n equals 1. And then it's just going to return 1. Uh, again, we don't want to include 0 in this. If you multiplied it by 0, it would clear out everything. So this is how this would work. If you, this is actually, this is real code, in case you don't believe me. If you call factorial 10, it is actually going to calculate 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 and return the value there. And then we end up with this crazy 36, 2, 8, whatever, whatever. And just in case you don't believe me, I actually took a screenshot of a Google search for the factorial of 10. You can see that the numbers match up exactly. So our function is doing what I am claiming it's doing. All right, so now how are we actually going to use this in the context of this weather app that we're building? Um, we're going to write a recursive function to find the lower limit of our range from our list. And it will return the index of the lower limit. So just like we saw before, our function is going to call itself until it hits a certain condition. And then it's actually going to return a value. Um, so you can see here, it's going to get the nth element from our color limit list. If the temperature is less than the temperature in that limit, or if we've hit the end of the list, return i minus 1. And then the way we're actually going to use that over here is, once again, we'll assume color is freezing, since our list goes from coldest to hottest. We'll assume color is freezing. If the value we get back is the last element in our list, which is burning and has no upper range, then we're just going to set the color to be burning's color. Otherwise, if we fall between that range, then we know that we have our color limit is at index. The upper color limit will just be index plus 1. And then we can use the mix function and the ratio function, just like we saw before. We'll pass um, mix nth color limit 1. We'll get the up and then our ratio function. So this makes for a fairly long line of code, but that's just because nth is sort of a verbose way to access elements in a list. And then same as before, we'll set our background color, increment row by 1, and continue iterating over the list. And then this is what we end up with. So the compiled CSS still looks pretty similar to what we had before, except all of the hex codes are just ever so slightly different. And we have um, like a much smoother and gradual gradient 
just the way that the temperatures actually change gradually, now our color representation of them changes gradually also. So this is what it looks like for Portland. Everything's a little bit more subdued. Um, Texas looks crazy. I don't want to go to Texas. Um, it's very hot. Um, New York still looks lovely. We can see there's a little bit more variance than we saw before where everything was just yellow because now it's actually calculating that it, we're getting closer to the next or lower color range. And then Alaska kind of also still looks crazy and pretty cold. Um, so now we have this nice gradual gradient, but maybe we can use color to denote even more information, such as the time of day. Uh, right now when I look at this, it seems like it's just going to be sunny and beautiful for the next 48 straight hours. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a few things. Now my list of temperatures is going to change. It's not going to just be a list of temperatures anymore. I'm actually going to use a list of lists of temperature time pairs. So I think that I cached this data earlier this morning. So at 11 AM, it was 66 degrees. At noon, it was 67, so on and so forth. And we'll loop over this list similar to how we did before, except now we need to use the nth function to figure out which one is the temperature and which one is the time. And then I'm going to write a time function that will return a percentage that we can use to shade the color of each row. Um, shade is a really awesome compass function that will make a color more black. So this will be a good way for us to kind of denote night by making the rows darker. So this is what our function looks like. Um, I'm going to start by taking time since it's 24 hours. I'm going to shift it all over by 12 and use the abs function, which will give me the absolute value. And then that way we know that like 0 or 12 is going to be our midnight, right? And then we can use this if function again. So it, I kind of just eyeballed this, but it looked pretty good if we only made color or hours within 5 of midnight dark. So if we're not within five hours of midnight, we'll just return zero, which means the shade function is not going to do anything. But if we are within five hours of midnight, we'll do a little bit of crazy math. Once again, I just kind of eyeballed this. But it'll do some math to figure out. It'll, the percentage will actually be higher the closer we are to midnight. And once again, we're going to use that percentage function so that we actually have a, the right kind of value to pass through our shade function. And this is what we end up with. Compiled CSS still looks pretty similar to before, but now we have more color variation than we saw before. You can see it starts to get darker as you get to midnight. You can actually like nest um, color functions. So if you wanted to shade it a little bit and then pass the result of that to the desaturate function, there's a ton of options and different things that you can do with color functions. They're really awesome. And we can use it here to kind of denote the temperature and the time. But now we've kind of created a new problem for ourselves where these darker rows at night, this text that we have written on them is kind of hard to read. So um, in this case, I'm going to use the contrast color function. And Tim's explanation of contrast color actually cleared up a lot of questions that I had about the results that I was getting. But more or less, what we're going to do here is if we're going to use this function to determine what our text color is going to be. And it'll check if our row is dark. We want to use the light text. If our row background is light, then we want to keep using the dark text. And this is what we end up with. So now it's a little bit easier to read the text during the, the nighttime hours. So this is where we are now. Uh, we started with something that was really blocky, not very interesting to look at. And we've ended up with something that has way more information, basically just by using colors. But there's one thing missing here. There's more to a weather report than just the temperature and the time. So we probably want to know if it's going to be raining or snowing or cloudy or whatever. So we're going to use icons for this. Um, I found a really awesome icon set of weather icons by Eric Flowers. Um, they're SVG icons, which are really easy to work with. They're good for any pixel density display. This particular set has over 92 icons which is way more than we need. And actually, the API that I'm using has a really cool feature where for each hourly weather report, it will include a string that it can be used as a class name to denote the weather. So what we're going to do, we're going to loop over 
um, a list and kind of create classes that we can use to um, make our icons. So the markup for this is pretty simple. We're just printing out this icon class from the API. The end result is that we'll have classes like icon partly cloudy, icon rain, icon clear day, and we'll match that up to something from our SVG icon set. And then in the SAS, we'll make a list of all of these classes. It's documented on the website, so I know what all of our options are gonna be. And then, just like we were iterating over lists before, we'll iterate over the icons list to create a class, set the background image, and the dimensions of the image. So I'm using a few really awesome compass functions here. Um, the image URL function will print out the whole URL syntax with the full path of your file, and then image height and image width. So in this case, I'm using SVG images for my background, but unfortunately, compass can't tell the image height and width of an SVG file, so I have a PNG fallback. But typically, most of the time when you're using SVG images, you wanna have a PNG fallback anyway, so it's not too bad that we have both formats. And then we'll pass the path to the PNG version of the icon to this image height and image width function. And this is awesome because anytime you compile the file, it's gonna look at your images and actually print out the dimensions of the image. So if you decide to change an icon out and it's bigger than it used to be or it's smaller, you don't have to come back here and like update your CSS with the new size. The next time you compile, it's just going to automatically print out the right size. So this is what we end up with. Uh, we have a bunch of classes that we can use anywhere. We have something that has icon clear day or icon clear night. We're gonna see the icon and it's gonna be the right size. And this is kind of what it starts to look like. But now we can see that we have the same problem with the icons as we had with the text. Sometimes when it's, the row is dark, it's a little hard to see what the icon is gonna be. So what can we do about that? Um, so what I did here is I actually changed the background images to be CSS masks. And then that way we can set a background color on the icon and that'll be the color that our icon, excuse me, shows up as. And once again, I'm just gonna use contrast color. It's gonna be the same exact logic that we use to figure out what color the text would be. And we're gonna use that same exact color for the uh, background color of the icon. And this is what we end up with. Now our icons on our text are the same, same color. But now we have kind of a new problem, which is that we have this hard-coded list of icons in our SAS file, and we need to make sure that they always match up with the icons that we have available in our images folder. Um, the API could remove any of these icons at any time, they might add new ones, and I don't really wanna have to come and like manually manage this list all the time, so we can use custom SAS functions to help us out in this case. The custom SAS function is a function that is actually written in Ruby, so you have a lot of extra power there than you would if you were writing a function just in your SAS file. And um, you've probably been using SAS functions a lot. You may have even been using them without realizing them for something like RGBA. So, like I said, custom SAS functions are written in Ruby, so you're gonna start off, you're gonna have a Ruby file, and every custom SAS functions Ruby file you have is gonna start and end like this. Basically what this says is, hey, SAS, I have some custom functions in here that I want you to use. Look at me, it's in here. And then once you have this, there's a few different ways that you can load it. If you are compiling SAS via the command line, there's an R flag and you pass it the path to your file and then when SAS actually compiles, it'll look in your Ruby file and use whatever functions it has available. If you're using Compass, you can actually drop them straight into your config.rb. Uh, you could create other Ruby files and include them from here. It's a pretty easy way to do it. So anyway, so we have our, our custom.rb and this is where we're gonna put our functions. Uh, I'll start with a really simple example before I get into our solution to our list problem. Uh, this is a function that will return the last element of a list. This would be perfectly easy to implement just within a SAS file. You could just loop over a list until you hit the last element and then return that. But Ruby actually has a last method that will do exactly what we want. So just for example purposes, we'll make a custom SAS script function that will kind of proxy the Ruby last method. And what we're saying here is we're going to define our function, call it last, it'll accept a list, and then it's just going to return the last value in our list. We can say end so that we know where our function ends. 
Um, this declare line is optional, but if you leave it out, you cannot pass named arguments to your function. In this case, it doesn't really matter that much. Also, just to be clear, this is just a simple example. There's obviously no error checking happening here. But this is how it would look when you used it. You could pass it a list, and then it would actually return the last value in that list. So this is what, how, how we're going to solve our problem of our uh, list of icons in our SAS file. I'm going to make a function that's called get SVG images, and it'll accept a path to the folder where we're storing all of our SVG icons. Um, in this case, we do want to have some error checking. We all know that a path to a file on a computer has to be a string. It's not going to be a number or a list or a Boolean. So this assert type line says, hey, this variable has to be a string. If it's not, don't proceed. And then again, we're using the declare line just for fun. And then this is really the meat and potatoes of this function. So again, this is all written in Ruby. It's pretty intense. I'm no Ruby expert, and it was a lot of fun trying to figure this out. So what this does is it's going to use a bunch of Ruby stuff to look in our directory at the path that we've specified. It'll loop over all of the SVG files in that folder. It'll turn the file name of each of those SVG images into a SAS script string and then it will return a SAS script list of all of those SAS script strings. And um, it's important to remember if you're writing custom SAS script functions, um, everything that comes in is going to be a SAS script data type, and everything that goes out has to be a SAS script data type. So this is what our code looked like before. We had a hard-coded list of the different icons that we wanted to create. But now we can change it to just say get SVG images and pass the path to our image folder, and it will return the list of all of the images in that folder. So now if we decide that we want to add icons, we can just put the icons in their folder, recompile our SAS, and all of our new class names will be generated based on that. And then another fun just optimization that you could make if you wanted, Compass has an inline image function, which will actually take the contents of the image and dump them right into your CSS file. And it'll look something like this. Uh, this is really good for if you want to reduce HTTP requests. Um, yeah. So this is what we end up with. Um, we started with something that didn't really look like much, and we ended up with something that has lots of color variation. It denotes the temperature and the gradual changes in the temperature, the changes in the time. We have icons, so we can see that it's going to be fucking beautiful in New York over the next two days. Uh, Texas, still not looking too hot. I mean, it's literally looking too hot. Um, Oregon looks really lovely. And then Alaska's is pretty funny. It's just going to be cold and snowy forever. Um, so there are actually a ton of other like optimizations and fun things that I would love to do if I could talk about this forever. Um, like I said, the compass image height and width functions don't work on SVG files, but I think that it would be possible to write a Ruby function that would look at the contents of an SVG file and figure out. I mean, if you look at the contents of an SVG file, there is actually an attribute for width and height. So it would be fun to do that so that we didn't have to use a PNG fallback if we didn't want to. Um, compass has amazing tools for spriting. Um, in my real life work, which is not this, we use Compass sprites all the time for everything. Nobody ever has to hand make a sprite or hand write CSS for sprites anymore. Um, that would be a cool thing to add as a fallback for these SVG icons. And then just another fun thing, I was thinking it would be cool if each row got blurrier the more humid it was. So just another thing that you can use visually to denote weather. And then, uh, Chris talked a lot about this earlier, and there's no way I could possibly do it justice, but there's even more stuff coming in SAS 3.3 that is going to be amazing, even just aside from all of the things that are going to make writing CSS a lot better. Um, there's going to be the, the map data type is probably going to change a lot of things for the better. It's going to kind of be like an associative array. Um, more advanced list operations, string manipulation functions. I think someone called out earlier that the if function would actually work. I think it's just going to be improved. And then there's going to be a ton more things other than that. And 
that's pretty much it. So does anyone have any questions about this crazy, crazy stuff? Oh, one thing that I did want to mention, obviously we wrote our custom functions in Ruby, but what if you're using libsass to compile, um, then you don't have Ruby? Well, that's okay, because Ruby is a Turing complete language, which means anything that you can represent in your custom Ruby functions, you can represent in any other language. So that's the answer to that. Thank you for asking that question. Cool. I guess that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>